Hello, and welcome to the Radical World Podcast. I'm Jose Leal. My partner, Matt Perez, isn't here today, but we've got a wonderful guest, Josh Spodek, author and podcaster extraordinaire. Uh, I've had the opportunity to listen to a couple of podcasts and really enjoyed it. Welcome, Josh. Glad to be here. I hope you're doing well, too. I am. I am. I am. I, I'm um, enjoying the fall here in California. You're out in New York City? Yep. I'm in Manhattan, and the leaves are mostly changed by now, but still some color in the in the trees. We're, we did a walk this morning, and nice, beautiful red foliage. Uh, not too typical, but here in, in Menlo Park, we, we do get a little bit of that, which is nice. Um, and the weather is just perfect. I don't know if it's gotten cold over there yet for you guys. On the contrary, well, you know, I work in sustainability, so I would say it's unseasonably warm, although by future standards, it's cool. Yeah, I get that. And and here it's been probably unseasonally cool because we we had um, a cold front come up from from uh, Alaska or come down, I should say. And uh, well, we were a bit shocked because we had had 90 degree weather, which is unseasonably warm a, a few weeks ago. So, yeah, that's that's the new future, right? That's the, the new normal. Uh, it, well, I mean, the no it won't settle down for a while. I mean, it's going to keep going up the change the change the the uh expectation that things aren't going to be what they were yeah that's the new normal so i wanted to to have a conversation with you because the work that you're doing the books you're writing the podcast um it's all around sustainability it's it's around understanding how do we become more sustainable if such a thing exists, because it's either sustainable or not sustainable. Um, so how do you see that? Like, is there a tipping point for you? Or do you see this as sort of, yeah, we're more sustainable, but um, sustainability has not been reached? Definitions are, lots of people have lots of definitions. To me, the when people come into a field for the first time, and they're not very experienced, they often tend to see things as black and white. Either we save all everything or we completely collapse. When we get in, and it, not just sustainability, but in many fields, right. and as you learn more about that field, you start seeing the gradations. So um, th there's levels of collapse. There's, uh, there's a paper by uh, Cornell, some researchers at Cornell that say by 2100, there may be a billion climate refugees there may be 2 billion climate refugees. Now, for a lot of people, that's those are big numbers. It's also the difference of a billion people and the difference between that, suffering or not suffering, and the difference is what we do today. So if we, uh, everything that we do today makes a difference. And I'm not saying in the sense of the, the, the apocrypha, the story about the kid with the starfish. I mean, it. what we do today makes a big difference. So everything that we do to increase the Earth's ability to sustain life reduces suffering. And it is about life, right? But the whole thing here, even ourselves, we're a piece of life. And how we live has been, and that's the focus of what we've been doing at Radical World, is understanding how we make the experience of our lives better right? And in our workplaces and how work is structured and the, um, the existence of a system of command and control that we call the fiat system that's about imposing on people, a hierarchical system. And so for us, this focus on how do we live our lives better? Because our idea is that us living our lives better allows us to treat the world better, to treat the rest of life better. And yet there's this disconnect between those two things. Do you, you sense that? Do you, do you see the same thing? I think everybody wants cleaner air, cleaner land, cleaner water, uh, a future that's more health, healthy, safer, and secure for children. And yet we all do things that 
contribute to the detriment of those things. We all do. Mm -hmm. And we don't, even those who really don't want to, and we have plenty of excuses, but why are we stuck? I mean, this was a big question for me. Why are we stuck in a system in which we want to behave differently and it's incredibly difficult to, and it's very easy to keep doing what we're doing. So in my work on sustainability, people go through a lot of, people tend to go through stages in sustainability. They tend to be, I mean, we all as children don't know, don't care. We don't know that there are environmental problems. There's nothing we can, we don't think there's anything we can do about it. Not everyone, but some people get to another stage of learning that there's a problem, but maybe thinking there's nothing we can do about it. Then maybe thinking there's something we can do, but don't know what. And at various stage, there's a drop off at every stage and a very small number of people, as far as I can tell, reach a stage where I, we, we recognize we have to change our culture. That is, if we, there's all these different manifestations of the problems. Um, and this could be in, in the corporate world, but I'm going to talk about the, in, in sustainability, there's deforestation, there's ocean acidification, there's uh, biodiversity loss. There's, we cannot, we've all seen the headlines. We know lots of these things. It seems like a lot of different things, but they're all the results of our behavior and our behavior results from our beliefs, our stories, our images, our unquestioned beliefs, what makes up culture. If we could, if I could snap my fingers and magically put everything back to pre-industrial levels, bring back to life, all the extinct species, re, you know, recreate all the grasslands and, and, and old growth forests, but we kept our culture, we'd come right back here again. Right. Even the, among the small number of, of people who recognize we have to change our culture, virtually everyone then says changing culture is hard. I don't know if we can do that. Let me do something that's more doable. Let me do something that I know I can achieve. And so maybe they'll run for office. They'll start a company to market something that's uh, green, clean, renewable. Uh, they'll protest, they'll get, run for office. You know, um, what they often don't realize is that once you go back into the system, say you make something much more efficient. If you make a polluting system more efficient, you pollute more efficiently, right? You know, your one thing might be less emitting of something, but we're, it accelerates everything faster so that we get more of what we were doing before. And that's what we've been doing. I call that stepping on the gas, thinking it's the brake, wanting congratulations. Well, and, and, sorry, I was just going to say that isn't that efficiency, the name of the game in, in, in the world of work and corporations? It's a big value in our culture. To me, it seems tactical, not strategic. If your strategy is um, for the past several hundred years, let's take North America. People were settling from uh, coming from Europe and settling. And it looked like there was an infinite, basically infinite land in front of them. And it made a lot of sense that we need more labor, have lots of kids, uh, the, the Atlantic slave trade. We, we've got to grow into this. And the more people we have, the more we can do, the more we can take advantage of what they would call improving the land. It made a lot of sense under those beliefs that it's infinite, or at least so much that we'll never see the end of it. Well, we happen to live in times in which that those conditions aren't there anymore. There's very little land, if any, that we can expand into that someone isn't there. Well, that was the case before, but they right. didn't think that way. So if we keep living by the values that may, to whatever extent they made sense then, they don't make sense today. Those assumptions aren't accurate. So if we keep pushing on, if we keep growing into space that there's no space to grow into, it doesn't work that well. The system is going to have, the system is going to push back. Do you think that there's something else that contributes to that worldview? Because we think of humanity as flawed. And I think that that understanding of humanity as flawed means that we have to control things, that we have to have hierarchies, that we have to have systems that are uh, about commanding and controlling, both at the governmental level and at the, the business level. 
does that make sense to you? Do you think that that aspect of our culture is another thing, not just this efficiency thing, but also this shift in thinking about humanity, not as an organism that operates the best it's evolved to, but as a flawed being that needs to be controlled by someone else. The way I look at it, I'm trying to decide how much history I should go into here because feel free. I'm going to give you how I got into how I realized something from history and anthropology of how I believe that we've gotten into this situation where we're in a system that we feel powerless. To, I mean, there's huge amounts of people feeling hopeless, hopeless, powerless, um, Disengage. guilt and shame, despair. And okay, so I want to change culture. I believe we have to change culture. Historically, there are a few examples of culture where people have deliberately changed culture on a global scale within the space of a lifetime or two. Abolitionism is the big one. And so I started studying abolitionism because an institution of slavery had been around since recorded history. And then within a couple generations or a couple of human lifetimes, it became illegal everywhere. It took a while, but, but much less than 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. And I came across in a book by, uh, called Capitalism and Slavery by Eric Williams, who is himself a descendant of slaves uh, be, and went to Oxford, but he's Trinidadian. And he wrote this very interesting thing. And I, roughly he said, racism didn't cause slavery. Slavery caused racism. Now I learned the other way. I learned Europeans thought Africans were stupid or, or you know, not human. And so they figured, well, they're like animals, so we'll put them to work. But that's not how, not, not how it happened. Eric Williams in the book shows that after the uh, slavery began in North America, it, for the first time, it made sense economically. And he, he does the math. He shows how people figured it out to have all the slaves of one skin color and all the slave owners of another skin color. It was like a three to one cost benefit in some way. I forget the exact details, look it up. But I mean, one of the big things was you could say, well, that person was the escaped slave and that person was not the escaped slave just by looking at them. Then afterward, they realized, wait, they started to feel guilty. They felt like, how do we justify this? How do we rationalize this? They didn't think that, but they did. Just like we do when we have some mm -hmm. cognitive distance, when we have internal conflict. And that led to, um, oh, they're not as smart as us. They're not as intelligent as us. Um, they like to be worried. We're, we're all the all the stuff that we've read yeah. in the history books. That begs the question, though, why was how did slavery get to be that way? Why did that system get to be that way? That resulted from colonialism, resulted from imperialism. Why was there imperialism? Because for most of human history. I'm sorry, I should say most of human existence. So before history, going back to 250, 300,000 years, we we're hunter gatherers, egalitarian, no hierarchies. I mean, very little, even male, female, old, young, gerontocracy, patriarchy wasn't there as far as we can tell. What changed was that, how does a dominance hierarchy form? Of dominance hierarchy forms when you have a necessary resource that can be controlled and no alternative to it. So for most of human existence, if I, if, for most of our ancestral past, if I said to you, you do my work for me, you go get the food. I'm just going to sit here and I'm going to, I'm going to enjoy the fruits of your labor. You would say, right. go do it yourself. And you'd walk away. <laughs> thanks. No, thanks. When you couldn't walk away, the first time in history, in human existence that that happened was when in the, in, in, a, in a few river valleys around the world, the Tigris and Euphrates, the Indus, the Nile, the Yellow River. It happened later in the, in, the, in the Americas. You had places where there was a surplus. There was agriculture started. And you could have a grain surplus that someone could control. In fact, someone had to control because if someone went to take it, someone had to protect it. And it was river valleys because outside the river valleys, if you tried to, if I told you what to do and you said, I'm going to walk away, you'd walk away from the river valley. There'd be not enough there to live on. So you'd have a, a necessary resource that could be controlled that, that um, with no alternative. 
and you had the dominance hierarchies formed for the first time. And I should say that because of the climate change before 12,000 years ago, as I've seen anthropologists say, before the Holocene, agriculture was impossible. Once the Holocene began, that's 12,000 years ago, it was inevitable. The climate became steadier. It wasn't because of humans. It just happened that way. And we got this surplus that led to dominance hierarchies. And when you have dominance hierarchies, the age of empires begins and you have these um, competitive strategies that emerge that if you, you have to protect your resource, no matter what, because if you don't, if you get deposed, you could die. Complacency can be fatal as, was, as I've read in the book on this. And so people had to form cultures of protecting resources or alternatively taking from other resources. This all resulted from, oh, I'm, I'm, I, skipped a, I skipped a step, I'm sorry. That's all right. If we have, if, if you and I live in a culture and we have a surplus, if we keep sustainable, that's things work out. But generally when there's a food surplus, the population grows and then you find something else that you lack, some mineral labor, things like that. And then you become unsustainable. If you're unsustainable, if you're sustainable, you're fine. If you're unsustainable, you're running out of something. You have the option of, at that point, you can switch back to being sustainable in which you have to change your culture. If you find another place that has extra of what you're missing and you have extra of what they're missing, you can trade and then you become, become a larger sustainable group. But more often you find another place and take from them. That's imperialism. And in the case of, of European imperialism, they'd already become unsustainable in Europe. Well, this is, you're way ahead of where I am. Because this <laughs> is now, think of the Tigris and Euphrates, the Yellow River, the Indus. So, um, if you're unsustainable, you must take from others. And let, you switch to being sustainable or take from others. If you take from others, that's imperialism. If you take their land, that's colonialism. If you take their labor, that's slavery. Upstream of all of these things is living unsustainably. Another thing, if I could, if I could snap my fingers and make all of racism go away, everyone who's racist becomes not racist. All the systems of, that embody racism were all egalitarian, but we remained unsustainable. We would recreate the conditions that created colonialism, imperialism, imperialism colonialism, and slavery in the first place. These dominance hierarchies that we're in, upstream of everything is living unsustainably, having that resource that can be controlled and not having a, I grew up with a, um, my family helped form and belonged to a food co-op. So it was worker owned co co collaborative. Mm -hmm. It was not a dominance hierarchy. Someone would be president for a little while, then they'd switch someone else would be. And if we had something more like that, we would not have, we would not be stuck in the systems that we are. But as long as we have these necessary resources that can be controlled and they remain controlled like that, we have dominance hierarchies. And in a dominance hierarchy, we form two cultures. One at the top that says, we're good. We're doing the right thing. Racism. Uh, and at the bottom, you have something that says, a culture that says, if the risk of failing at rebelling is too high, then they say, we shouldn't try. The meek will, have, will inherit the earth. Uh, the, the rewards, we'll have the reward in the afterlife. Um, well, and that and maintains the hierarchy. That's what we have today is these cultures that say the people at the top are like, we're helping, we're job creators. Uh, the people at the bottom saying, um, it's not worth it to try. Uh, um, the plane was going to fly anyway. Um, what I do doesn't matter. Only governments and corporations can make on this, a difference on the scale that we need. And it's very difficult to break out of these things. But that's why I see us being stuck. But these I, I, I apologize, I jumped around a little bit. I, no, 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 it's good. I, and I... I I understand your point, and, and I think it's all very valid. Um, and what I see is that these hierarchies have, through that history that you just told, been able to divide and conquer. And we don't feel divided and conquered, but we are. And so part of the inability for the, the, the bottom half, if you will, 
Half. to yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly, right? Um, to be able to rebel, to to change things would require that they actually feel a sense of being able to work together with their fellow man. And we don't trust each other. We don't have the same systems we used to have. We, we no longer, you know, bowling alone, right? We no longer have community gatherings in the same way that we used to. That's been diminishing since the 60s till today. We don't have clubs. We don't have organizations where we, we commune with our local uh, neighbors, with our members of our community. We've become so divided, both by our politics and by our work, that it's hard to, to imagine people coming together collectively to try to overcome the current systems of hierarchy that we're talking about. Yeah, it takes, there's a word that embodies the following phrase for me, helping other people, helping people do what they already wanted to do, but haven't figured out how. That's my definition of leadership. A lot of people associate, they, they, they have different connotations and I, I'm not, I don't right. want, helping people do what they already wanted to do, but haven't figured out how. And without it, and that, that's different from management and yeah, I mean, divide and conquer is, is a strategy or tactic for people at the top of the hierarchy to keep it that way. You said divided, I would say isolated. Mm -hmm. And a lot of this isolation is, you know, in the, in the first industrial revolution, we started using machines to do things beyond what humans could do on their own. So um, crossing oceans by ship or continents by railroad, uh, building buildings taller and so forth. And there've been waves of industrial revolution. Later ones were on city planning and other types of not just mechanical engineering. All right, it, it enables us to do things that we couldn't do before. It also kept us from doing things that we no longer accomplish things. I mean, we did, humans did create pyramids before. They did cross oceans before without steam. And, but everything that's done for us is something we don't accomplish ourselves. So that makes us less able. We're less coordinated than we used to be. We're right. less, I did this, oh man. I, someone, they were looking at triremes, these ancient Greek boats, and they, someone looked at um, some history and saw how the triremes had moved from one port to another, and they calculated the amount of exertion it took. And it was just regular boats doing regular things, and it was like Olympic-level exertion, but it was regular people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm sure they're big error bars, but people could do more than they could today. Well, in today's world, we have computers doing what our minds do. And what computers do for us, we are not accomplishing ourselves. So we're not learning. We're less emotionally and intellectually able. You know, we're more obese than ever. That's machines doing things for us. Right. We're less, uh, someone who's on my podcast, she wrote a book called Emotional Obesity about how our minds are not as capable as they used to be. And, you know, I just read a thing today about how college professors can't assign books anymore because students from high school don't, they haven't read books cover to cover. And so in terms of organizing and people working together, it's harder to do when we're less thoughtful, less reflective. But also less feeling, right? Because- Less emotionally able. Less emotionally able because we have lost our emotional skills as well. It's, it's not just the physical and the mental but the emotional as well. I would argue more so. If you think of emotions as homeostatic functions, as uh, Damasio refers to them, um, our emotions are there to regulate our, our interactions with others. And when you don't interact with others in the same way, you don't have to figure out how we're going to arrive at the right answer because it's already dictated for you. You yes, don't everything have to decide who's going to be in it running the show right now because it, it's not a decision. The boss is already assigned. Too bad, so sad. It might not be the right boss for this task, but that's who you've got. And that's what's going to happen. Yeah, historically, there's an example of this. When the Europeans came to North America, the people who came were not 
particularly, uh, I mean, they're good, they're adventurers. And the Native Americans that they met were like Condi Ronk was a big one. Uh, this is, I got it in um, Tribe by Sebastian Younger, an anthropologist by training, and um, the, um, the Dawn of Everything mm -hmm. by David Graeber and uh, David Wengro. And they talked about how the North Americans rhetorically ran circles around the Europeans. And one of the reasons was that at the time, Europe was a very stratified hierarchy. There was no, how are you born? That determined your station in life. Right. So when there were disagreements, the person with higher status told the people with lower status, this is what you do. And they had to because it was enforced. Right. Dominance hierarchy. Whereas yeah. in North America at the time, it was much more democratic. And so they, may, as an aside, they make the case that a lot of the Renaissance in Europe was non, was them finding actual democracy happening in other places around the world and bring that back to Europe where democracy hadn't existed for a long time. And we talk about discovering Greek stuff, but also apparently coming from lots of other places. And apparently lots of Native Americans were very skilled at rhetoric and politics because they participate in politics every day. If I want you to do something with me, I can't tell you what to do. I have to negotiate. I have to do politics. I have to do civic duty with you. And that meant that everyone's social and emotional skills were much higher because they'd been trained the, the, the way that muscles, if trained, yeah, exactly. become stronger. And Europeans just didn't have it. And we are as stratified as ever today. And therefore we aren't getting that training. Now there are many times in history, well, not many, but some of, you know, the creation of democracy or the Magna Carta or um, the independence of the United States or India, where uh, antitrust legislation, um, jubilee years that were moves away from the stratification back to um, not equality of outcome, but uh, equality under the law, mm -hmm. a move away from dominance hierarchy. Now, I want to distinguish also this, de de this democratic hierarchy which is not the same as a, as a, right. so, it, and also dominance hierarchies aren't always bad. Uh, my example that I liked is if, when I go sailing, there's a skipper on the boat and the skipper knows a lot more about sailing than I do. If the skipper tells me trim the sail, I'm going to trim the sail. I'm going to do what I'm told because that skipper has control over my safety, my getting back to land. So I'm, ha I happily choose to be in a dominance hierarchy in that situation. Well, I wouldn't consider that a dominance hierarchy myself. Um, I consider a dominance hierarchy when the system itself imposes a hierarchy outside of the participants and the environment, right? When you step foot on that boat, you know he knows more. You know it's yeah. his boat. You so know I, he I has chose, that experience. I chose to get into it. Right. But if we go out to sea, if, he, if, if the skipper decides... To, uh, to tell me to do something I don't want to do and I, and I think is wrong, I'm stuck. I still have to do it. Now, you're thinking if he's only giving, or he or she is giving orders that I, I want to comply with, but it might not be the case. Now, a democratic hierarchy would be one like in the food co-op where if someone doesn't do, if someone starts breaking rules and uh, abusing their authority, the rest will say, okay, you're out. Fair enough. And, and, and in the case, in a situation where, you know, in a corporate environment, we've got a CEO who's saying, I'm going to lay off two thirds of my company. Um, and they have their justifications for that. People across the board don't have much of a say about whether that's going to happen, how it's going to happen, when any of that, right? Um, mm -hmm. and, and that process of um, the placement of someone at the top of an organization today doesn't happen by empowerment from below, right? It comes from outside the organization. It comes from the shareholders or from some other direction. Somebody gets placed in there through the board or something of that nature. That, that's not a, a, a democratic environment. That's not a place where people have a say in what's going on, um, even though that person may be the best person to lead, but 
those people haven't made that decision or that choice. And that's true all the way down the hierarchy, the VPs and the, you know, the management, uh, uh, middle management in those roles. Having been there, I understand what it's like to be an employee and know that the person who's your boss doesn't understand the work you're doing as well as you do, doesn't have the experience that you do. Those kinds of things are what I think need to be corrected in some way. And to me, organizations are unsustainable as we know them. And addressing the unsustainability from a human perspective, as well as an environmental perspective, is I think a, a priority for us. And, and so when what you're describing from your personal perspective, uh, you know, in your books and, and your podcast, I, I want to sort of say yes, but in the workplace, that takes up the majority of our waking hours. So even when we change our, how we eat and how we live within our home, we don't have the power to, right now to change how we do our work and what kind of work we do and the impact that that work has. You ended there talking about power. So what's power? What is power? The ability yeah. to exercise one's ability, one's ability to exercise over something else, to change to change the, the environment around them, to change the circumstances they're in, uh, to, to change anything within their uh, environment. If I'm an employee at, an, at a corporation and I'm somewhere in the middle or bottom of the hierarchy, what power, what's power in that context? Uh, well, it depends. If you're the folks that just went on strike and six weeks over at Boeing, uh, that's power the ability to make some change, but it's a very limited uh, set of powers that they have. And it's very rare that those powers are, ex are, are exercised. I contend that the, the person at the bottom of the hierarchy, if they don't like it, they're not asking to be put at the bottom of a hierarchy. It's imposed on them. Mm -hmm. The person at the top of the hierarchy has the ability to take away something. They have access to a resource that, that, well, if there's an alternative, if you don't like the company, but you can get a higher paying job somewhere else, no problem. If you don't, if, if your access to the resources that you need of shelter and food and things like that are limited and people have control over those things, then the power is, you don't have the power to walk away. Right. I agree with that. It's imposed on you. So what enables the people who have control to control? that's access to these resources. It could be the money you need to pay for things. It could be shelter. And over time, it went from just control over food to control over lots of things. Right. In our world today, control over energy is one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. And it, the more and more concentrated that is, that's the source of mu much of our hierarchy. So as long as we depend on now, we, we haven't depended, human life doesn't require things that pollute, doesn't require fossil fuels. Our culture does. Right. So as long as we continue participating in a culture that depends on these things that can be controlled, we're, we are contributing to the hierarchy that is entrapping us. I could not agree more. As long as we live unsustainably, we cannot get out of the situation. I suppose it's possible we could create some sort of cooperative structures on a, on a great scale, mm -hmm. but if we keep growing, our dependence gets greater and greater and greater and becomes more and more unstable, unstable toward someone taking charge and controlling the resource. So it's, we're, not we're not very stable this way. So really the, the more we decrease that dependence, the more chance we have at empowering everyone in, in it, no matter where they are in their hierarchy. 
But as long as that dependence remains, as long as we're buying airplane tickets, SUVs, um, food flown all around the world, plastic, we are reinforcing these hierarchies, actually increasing them because of that concentration of power. Well, and, and, and then there's, you know, the real estate that we live in, right? Um, for most of human history, we didn't have to pay to live somewhere. We had to maintain whatever shelter we, we built uh, mm -hmm. on whatever land we had, uh, but we didn't have this real estate as a profit center um, as a, to deal with. And so now our, our very homes are uh, more valuable than residences, right? The, the value of a home or a property is now uh, a, a stock market based valuation rather than um, the sense of, of value to me as, as an individual to be able to have a shelter over my head. So all of those things are unsustainable. Um, and, and I think from a, a, a work perspective and a living perspective, how do we, because as little as you do, you're in Manhattan, you said, mm -hmm. I believe? Yeah. You live in an apartment, I'm assuming. Yes. And, and that apartment belongs to some corporation probably. It's a co-op building, but yeah, the, the ownership okay, is weird. Well, but, yeah. Okay, well, it's a co-op building. And that's essentially, that's what we're advocating for is, is how do we take some- uh, It's not, it's not co-op in that sense, okay. but it's just different ownership than like condominiums, but it's still not cooperative in the way okay, that- Okay, okay. Co right. co with. Um, how do we, we still have these high costs of, of housing as, a huge impediment to our ability to uh, live sustainably, right? Yeah, although it should be, in terms of real estate being valuable, it's always been valuable. Um, usually it's land that is arable land, historically mm -hmm. control over arable land. But land in the middle of a desert is not valuable. So again, it is tied to access to natural resources. Cities aren't just anywhere. So New York City is built, oh man, Apparently, if if this area where I live had been protected when humans first came here, so that's 10,000 years ago, long before uh, Europeans found it, it would have been, if it was protected like Yellowstone is, it would be one of the most biodiverse areas in the Americas. Now it's one of the most paved over. Right. So it was, um, cities generally pop up where there's, tr you know, natural resources. Of course. That can be controlled. Now, now we have cities in the desert like Arizona, but that depends on, we've, we've moved the dependence from natural resources, renewable natural resources to, um, to fossil fuels and so forth. So it's not just land, it's still access to resources. You can, no one's, you can build a, a home in the middle of the Sahara Desert if you want. Sure, but my point isn't that, that the, the home has changed in, in its value based on the the control of resources. But that, say, for example, here in California, I don't remember the number, I, I don't want to misstate it, but a very good percentage of single family homes are now owned by corporations. And oh, yeah, private industry, private uh, equity. And yeah, right. Driving up the price of real estate. And with every downturn in the real estate market. Can I do that? Uh, are you on okay. a Mac? No. Okay. That's okay. What okay. Um, Linux. So on a, with every downturn in the market, you get, you know, all these homes, bankruptcies and so forth. They get picked up by corporations and a reduction of actually privately owned homes. So it's not that there obviously you know I, I live in california i know the value of land in the sense that there are 40 million people that want to live here you know sunshine taxes mm -hmm. they call it um and i understand that that there is demand for for the property here but what we've done is made real estate not just be about 
needing to have a home and living in that home. But we've actually made real estate about um, a profit center, right? For corporations, for investment that divorces our need and our, our desire for a sustainable place to live and turns it into someone else's uh, profit. It doesn't turn, it's imposed on us. Yes. The, it, the, uh, it's really important to see what's, what allows someone to impose himself, their, their, their wishes on you that you can't walk away. And no, to change that, we, I mean, as, you, as you allude to, we have to work together, right. those of us who are not at the top of the hierarchy. And as far as I can tell, that takes leadership helping others do what they want to do, but haven't figured out how this is, I'm not talking about autocracy. I'm not talking about dictatorship. I'm not talking about, uh, um, other misconceptions, other, other, right. other conceptions of it. And it's been done in the past. I think it takes, I mean, in a corporate environment, people often talk about a mindset shift followed by continual improvement. Cause if, as long as we believe that what I do, if, if I say we have to organize and collaborate and work together, and someone says, yeah, but what I do doesn't matter. That's the belief that someone in the bottom of the hierarchy will tell themselves. It's an, a big part of culture is unquestioned beliefs. So as long as we hold on to those beliefs, whether they're true or not, we'll right. act on them. So absent that mindset shift, people will very, very, very strongly resist what could help them if they feel, if I try and it doesn't work, the repercussions, oh, I just watched On the Waterfront. Uh, I don't know if you saw it with uh, Marlon Brando and it's a 1954 movie about yeah, how- a long time ago, yeah. A, um, a union on the waterfront is being controlled by a mobster. And all the, um, so the mobsters, he's, he, tells him, he tells the world and himself that he's making things better. He's working, he's, he's good. The people at the bottom are not testifying they're D and D, deaf and dumb, is what they would say, and they were so that if someone went to testify, the others would try to stop that person from from testifying. So they were because they recognized if you testify, then I'm gonna have to testify, and if we fail, then the repercussions would be we all hurt because people are getting thrown off buildings. So they create a culture of just don't rock the boat. It, it was considered noble to act against their own interests because of that fear. And that's what we have today. That it's not quite so obvious as in the movie, because the movie's dramatized. Right, right. But we feel like what we do doesn't matter. Of course, what we do matters. Could you imagine raising your children saying, it's okay, son, daughter, what you do doesn't matter. No one would do that, I, I hope. And yet we tell ourselves that all the time. So we have to change our beliefs to recognize what we do does matter. It's not just uh, governments and corporations have to change, but that's the end of the marathon, not the beginning. We first so we have to. I, I want to. I, I know you've written a book, and uh, yeah, uh, you have to show it, please. It just came out. Like the the book, the box right there, is anyway. Congratulations on that. Please, yeah. um, and congratulations on the article yesterday. Uh, and on the New York Times. New yeah. York Times, yeah. Um, a slow news day, I guess. <laughs> not quite. Um, and, and we didn't even talk about yesterday, so let's yeah. let's just leave that out of the equation. Um, so, tell me about what you're doing and and the focus um, that you're taking, because I agree with you. It is about the individual. But I don't think that it's solely about the individual. And I don't think that the systems change at the end. I think that they change in parallel, that systems emerge from people's changes in mindset and worldview and emerge to replace the old systems uh, over time. That I agree with. It takes a long time for it to happen. But it's not like everybody's going to change their mindset and then we'll change the organizations and then we'll change government. Yeah. So on, on that part, there's many things that I'm doing, but on that part of changing culture right now, 
Oh man, I get asked in, in, in podcasts all the time, what would you do if you're a dictator for a day? I'm like, dictator, that, that's the opposite of what I want. Exactly. I, 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 want I only want things through democracy. I, I don't want dictatorship. And what, but then people want, well, then how do we pass these laws? If you believe that living more sustainably makes your life worse, then your only path is authoritarianism, is authoritarianism and, and fascism because you have to get people to do stuff they don't want. Now, what I've done, and there's a whole story behind this, if I've, I've, I've actually tried living more sustainably. I'm off the grid. It was very, very difficult at first, but then became actually contrary to all the beliefs I expected because of the culture I grew up in. It was actually very rewarding. And it took me a long time to go through the stages on, on personal level to see, does this really improve my life? If not, if the cure is worse than a disease, I'll take the disease. But it turned out the cure is better than disease. And as far as I know, no one with a voice in sustainability is trying to live sustainably. So they don't know through practical hands-on experience that it's actually a wonderful life. To, to think of how my behavior affects others all the time is actually very, very human. It's lovely. Mm -hmm. So um, then I also had to, could I tell, could I lead others to find this as well? Was it just a quirk about me that I just happened to like being compassionate or is that human and not just being compassionate? Right. Could I lead others to sustainability? And then I, so I developed something called the Spodek method, which the, the book talks about. And that developed two strategies, bottom up and top down. You have to do both. It can't be just one and more than that. But one of them is working with influential people, CEOs, uh, business leaders, political leaders, cultural leaders, like actors and singers and athletes to, on my podcast, I walk them through the Spodic method so that they, they act on their environmental values and they generally find it rewarding. And that creates role models. People see it's not just me. The bottom up part is I do these workshops where I walk people through this process and teach them how to do it, where they experience, first they share their values, not the values of the culture, which may be imposed on them, but their values toward nature. And then I invite them to act on those values, those emotions, which is very different than saying Bangladesh is going to be underwater. Here's what you have to do. That's extrinsic. That's lecturing. That's telling people what to do. That's coercion. It's cajoling. It's convincing. It's very counterproductive. But if I invite them, could you do something to act on those values that you care about, that you say improve your life? And they come up with something themselves. Inevitably, they like it. They find it rewarding usually joy or wonder or awe or spirituality or the divine or connection. And they want to do almost everyone who does it. They do more than they expected. They do more than they committed to. And they want to do yet more. They feel joy and gratitude. And then I teach them how to do what I did with them with others. So what they share is joy with the expectation of gratitude. So that's something that spreads on its own in a way that's saying, don't use straws. It doesn't quite spread or right. meatless Mondays. As far as I know, there's no one doing this. In the corporate world to change culture, I haven't thought about that. How to lead, I'm sure there's a way to, to I'm not sure, I haven't thought about it. But what I do is I, the bottom up approach is to spread, I, I work on what spreads, ideas that spread win. Because I know that we want, everyone who takes a step toward living more sustainably wants to take the next step if they've had the mindset shift. If it's not imposed from without, so I work more on the slope than the y-intercept. I'm not saying comply. I'm saying mm -hmm. try this out. It's not even me saying try this out. It's me connecting with their values, helping them connect with their values and inviting them to act on it. Then they like what they've done. It's really, I, I, I can put it into words, but it's kind of like trying to describe Beethoven's right. of the night. It, it's the feeling that people get in the workshop. I mean, people cry when they realize what they've been doing and telling themselves what, what else can I do? They also cry when they realize, oh my God, I can change the world. This is enjoyable. There's a path to sustainability where every step along the way is enjoyable. And where when I spread it, people won't be like, I know, stop telling me, what can I do about it? Instead they respond, how do you do that? How can I do that? And, and we're back full circle because we started this with, it's about life. And things that we enjoy doing, things that feel good, 
are things that serve life. That's why we feel good about good things. Um, so it's, it seems to me that what you're touching upon is living a better life will get you in touch with living life in a better way. It's tough to, that's a little too loose because people with values that disagree with yours will feel that they're living a good life and you'll conflict with them. But you're asking so, them for values that aren't taught to them, but the values that are about life itself is my are, understanding of what you've described. One of the big discoveries I found in doing the Spodic Method with so many people is that all right, education, levels of taxes, level of military, these are going to be things that lots of people disagree on. But everyone has deep-seated connection to the environment. Right. Everybody prefers, um, it, well, it's different for everyone. I mean, some people who grow up by the beach, it's more beach-related. If you grow up in the mountains, it may be more mountain-related, but there's something. Right. So if I can't do that with sports or playing music, or you know what what major people have in college because people pick lots of different things, but in sustainability, there's one place. There may be others, but at least this one place. Everybody prefers clean air to dirty air. But if you just say, "Do it for clean air," that's been so abused by environmentalists who are trying to coerce and control and convince and seek compliance that people, we have defenses against that. There's a lot to it. You really, it's not just live a better life and it's and it's better. It's uh. It takes a lot of nuance and finesse. Yeah, and I'm not trying to minimize it to, to that uh, level, uh, but we are out of time. And I'd love to sort of dig deeper, but unfortunately we don't have time for that uh, today. So maybe we can uh, have a follow-up conversation and dig a little deeper in, in what you're doing. Because I find it very interesting that your approach uh, though I, I'm not super familiar with the Spodek method, um, your approach of connecting with what feels right for you from a life values perspective, um, to me, is a, a path forward for how we change the way we work, the way we communicate with each other and belong in our communities. And I think yeah. if we can figure out how to do that, not just for us, but in community, um, then we have a, a way forward that allows us to make the changes we need to make. If something's gonna improve your life, I should be able to work with you to evoke that. And if not, I, I shouldn't be imposing myself on you. And so if, if it's really gonna make people's lives better, it took me years and years and years, but we should find ways to activate and liberate and unleash people to do these things as opposed to coercing them or saying it's for your own good. I don't like that those ways. I, I think well, they're kind of productive. I totally agree. And I, and I think, unfortunately, that the only two ways that currently are sort of mainstream are we're going to do carbon credits or we're going to tell you it's for your own good. Uh, and there really isn't much more <laughs> uh, options right now for people to take. So really appreciate the work that you're doing huh. in this space. Here's options. Yes. <laughs> There's some options. Exactly. Josh, thank you for, for your time today. Thank you for the work you're doing and for sharing with us uh, your thoughts and views on both sustainability and, and how do we see how we got here, which I think you have a story that is compelling. Um, it's not dissimilar from the one that I use, which is we arrived at this place due to a lot of reality, but the reality has changed. So it's time to do something different. Also, a lot of the people that made the decisions that brought us here at the time made decisions that seemed like the right choices at the time. There's a lot fewer bad guys than people think here, but Absolutely. sadly a lot a lot fewer good guys either. There's no one asleep at the wheel. It, yeah. Someone has to, there's no one whose job is to fix the environment. And so if we all do our jobs and figure that someone will then pick up the slack, there's no one there. Some of us have to do something different that we're doing so that we don't just all sit there saying, I did my part, 
when there's no one whose part is to fix these things. Some of us have right. to do something different that we've ever done before. The problem is a collective problem and the solution has to be a collective solution. It isn't, there isn't one person that did this, nor is there going to be one person that's going to fix it. It's uh, from one perspective, you could call it wicked or nasty or really hard. From another, from another perspective, if it takes all we've got and we, if it's, it's an opportunity for us to reach our potentials and do the best that we can, it's a historical time. Absolutely. Again, Josh, thank you. I'm going to announce uh, next week's guest, which is David Gull. He's co-founder and CFO and uh, Daniel Yamber of the new Helvetica Brewery. Really looking forward to these folks joining us. Um, they're a new co-op. We were talking about that just now with um, Josh. Uh, co-ops and how they're changing the way we see work and the way that work works. So looking forward to that conversation because they are um, they have just formed their co-op that are both uh, employee co-op and a consumer co-op. So their customers also own uh, shares in the organization. So looking forward to learning more from that. Josh, hopefully we will get a chance to do this again. I really appreciate you being here. Thank you. I would look forward to it. All right. Cheers.